Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Unfortunately, trees get diseases, die, and have to be removed. Today, we're going to cut down a tree. Also, ornamental grasses create landscape interest in the summer and winter. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Wes Hopper. Wes is a certified arborist and a natural resource manager for the city of Germantown right here in Tennessee. And Joel and Diamond will be joining me later. Wes, so what are we about to do? We're getting ready to cut a tree down. Wow. We're not just randomly cutting down a tree. Okay. We're cutting down a tree that has died. And before it becomes a hazard, we mm -hmm. are in a Oaklawn Gardens Park. Okay. And it's starting to get a little brittle. I was hoping for it to stand long enough for me to find out why it died. Okay. But I'm not going to wait around for that. It's time to get rid of it. Time to bring it down, huh? Yep. But you know what? The good thing is I'll plant another one. That's right. That's right. So what kind of tree? This is a green ash. Green ash. Yep. And we're worried about the emerald ash borer yeah. coming through, but I haven't seen any signs of that. Okay. So is that why you think the tree died possibly? Or? No, this is one of those deals where I, I can't find a reason for it to have died. Oh, okay. No root fungus, no boring activity other than what's going on now. Okay. Uh, it just gave up the ghost. Oh, how about that? That happens from time to time, right? It's probably something in the ground. Okay. You know. All right. So what do you need to do to get ready? Okay, I need to have a clear work zone for one. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I got to set the rope in the tree because I want this to be a directional fall. Okay. It's not a random fall. I need it to for sure go in the direction that I want it to go. Okay. For one reason, it's standing straight up and down. I've measured it and it, it, the tree is pretty much a straight tree. Okay. So if I'm, while I'm cutting, a gust of wind could come through and force it to go back the other direction that I don't want it to go. So I'm going to put this rope in the tree and uh, Jared is going to be pulling on the rope to assure that it goes in the direction that we want it to go. Okay. But before we pull on it to make it go that way, I'm, I'll be putting in a notch in the tree. Okay. The notch will go one third into the, into the wood approximately. And then I will come back in on the back side and uh, make a back cut and it's going to go into Enough to make it have at least a 10% hinge. Wow, okay. That hinge is what's going to hold it together, and make it land in the right spot. In the right spot. Yep. So how far away do people need to be? They need to be out of the drop zone. Out of the drop zone. Yes. Okay. Which would be the height of the tree, okay. typically. I'm cutting approximately a, about two and a half, three feet from the ground. Okay. And uh, so that, you know, you that's going to be weight, my waist level. Right, so waist level, okay. Yeah, I right. want to be comfortable as I'm cutting this. Okay. I don't want to be in a bind. I want to make sure that my chainsaw has a full tank of gas <laughs> yeah. and that the teeth are sharp okay. and the chain is tight. All important things before yeah. you start your cut. Okay. I'll be communicating with anyone else standing around me. I, we, we may be using sign language, things like, you know, headache or stand clear or Geronimo, yeah, you know, okay. just as long as your team or your whoever your work buddy or whomever understands the language that you're trying to interpret. Sure, no, that, all that makes sense to me. Yep. And I see you have all your safe, I safety do. equipment, so that's I do. good. Yep. Right. So I don't wear gloves, that's one thing. Oh, I, you don't wear gloves, okay. No, I don't. Is there a reason why you don't wear the gloves? I want to be able to feel the rope in my hand. Okay. I want to be able to feel the tools that I have. Okay. It, now, if there were thorns or something like that, I'd, I'd make different preparations, but Okay. That, I've been that way my whole career. Okay, good deal. Well, Wes, we're going to go ahead and let you uh, get started with that. Okay, it is a hot day. I'm, I'm going to take my safety glasses off and wipe the sweat out of my eyes. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, and I will get out of the way. Okay. It's safety, right? Safety. Mm -hmm. All right, stand clear. Headache, I'm throwing. Nice shot. I have it in the center, most strongest point. Okay, my groundman, Jared, weighs about 180 pounds, and he's gonna put 180 pounds of pressure on this rope. This tree probably weighs about two, 250, so that should be ample. 
ample weight factor to get this tree over. Now I want to make sure this is, rope is clear of my chainsaw. That's why I'm sliding it up a little bit higher and making sure that tail is out of the way. Now, I'm going to get this out of the way, Jared, if you want to take this. You have your hard hat and safety glasses. Got everything. Muffs, all right. Why don't you stand right there next to that brush pile. And since we actually haven't pulled a tree down together, put your rope to your right over there. That's good. Go ahead and tighten up. Not hard, just get the rope, no tense. And your exit strategy would be to go 45 degrees behind that cypress tree. All right, and this means it's coming down or staying clear. I'm going to put my earplugs in, so if you have anything to say, say it to me now. I'll hold the chains, my elbow to my ribs so I don't drop start. This notch is a Humboldt notch. When this notch folds and closes, it should let, cause the tree to land flat. Tree's coming down. All right, Chris, it's safe to come back in. All right. About that. Yes. It's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. So what do you think about your efforts here? I think we were successful. Everything went as, as planned, and that's uh, one of the important things about running a chainsaw, dropping a tree, is just having a good plan. Yeah. You know, don't haphazardly go out there and say, I'm going to go cut a tree today and yeah. without a plan. Right. Got to have a plan. How about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, this is pretty cool. I did leave one thing out. I mean, it's one of the rules, you know, I'm, I'm a professional, so okay. I have to mention this, is uh, I did not instruct, and I typically do, it's usually something that we know to do. We have plenty of cell phones here, so uh, we have to be prepared to call 911 in the event that an emergency would happen. Right. But that's just that's just general work standards. Okay. Well, Wes, we thank you so much. We appreciate it. Glad to do You're it. You're the best. So it's always good to have a what? Certified arborist. Certified arborist. And that you are. Yes, sir. Thank you much. You can attract many different kinds of birds to your yard with a variety of feeders. Two of our feeders here today are seed and suet. With the type of habitat given here, you'll be likely to see maybe chickadees, tufted tip mice, Carolina wrens, this feeder here has a platform for your blue jays or even your cardinals to stand on, or your woodpeckers would cling to the suet and peck out pieces of suet. They would be insect eaters in nature, but they'll come to your feeders if you have suet available. Now let's talk about ornamental grasses, oh, right? Yes. Something let's, that we love to see in the garden, let's, right? Let's talk about something that we really, really <laughs> like to have in right. the garden, and which is ornamental grasses. Okay. And I have enjoyed ornamental grasses for years. Mm -hmm. They've been around for a while, yes, but time. their recent popularity, they are, have gotten very popular in the last few decades. So the amount of varieties, mm. forms, colors, it's just, it's, it's exploded. Mm -hmm. um, almost every garden center that you go to or nursery will have a whole section yes, they do. on ornamental mm -hmm. grasses.
when we're talking about ornamental grasses, just remember we're talking about all grass-like plants. They, they like the sedges, the rushes, the millets, the oats, okay. and ornamental oats, and then the uh, ornamental rices and cattails all in with, as an ornamental grass section. Didn't know that, okay. So right. when we talk about ornamental grasses, we're talking about all these different okay. varieties. One thing I like about the grasses is that they look very different. They, are, um, they bring a lot of sound and movement to the garden because every time the wind blows, yeah. the, those grasses, they just move. Right. And sometimes they are used as a substitute for water in a garden because they're, of their movement, just like the water. Okay. Of course, the sun, in the app, now that the, the, it's fall, the seed heads have all popped up on all of them. And in the evening, those seed heads, they glow in the sun. Ah in the evening. So it gives a completely different look right. to the landscape. Of course, ornamental grasses have texture and a form that is unique and different from any other plant in the garden. So that's why when you add it to a landscape or a perennial garden, it, it gives a different look to your landscape. Okay. Um, massed together, you know, it, with, a, with a house around it, it on a hillside, It'll change throughout the season. You'll get green, then in the winter, it, they'll be dried. Right. And you know, right. you get the seed heads in the fall, so it's, it changes. It makes the look of your property look different throughout the season. Mm -hmm. Of course, they look just as well in a perennial garden with other perennials. Sure. Again, different texture and form. Mm -hmm. I just think they, they make a unique statement. I like a lot of the grasses, but these are my favorites. Right, we'll one of them it. is the Mexican feather grass. It's okay. a small, petite grass, very fine textured and really billowy and blows in the wind and okay. very different from any other plant in the landscape. So it mixes well with that and gives you a different texture in the landscape. Um, carexes, mm -hmm. we have many carexes. Uh, they all have different colors. There's bronze, there's blues, there's reds, there's all different colors. Great mix, variegated ones, good to nice. put in containers. I love putting those in containers with other flowers okay. and stuff, so those look nice. Um, the miscanthus, probably the, mis the first plant that I, ornamental grass that I got was the miscanthus variegatus, and it's a variegated plant that gets about three, four, to four feet tall, and it's beautiful. Very nice, different color contrast to some of the other plants in the garden. And of course, adagio, Miscanthus adagio, probably the best ornamental grass for a landscape because it stays nice, has a nice form, and is probably the number one used ornamental grass in the, the landscape. For yeah. The yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's another one, Miscanthus, that I like real well. It's called Morning Light, and it has more of an upright form to it. But it's variegated, and it's got small leaves, so it kind of glows right. okay. in the landscape because it's got that variegation going. Okay. Very nice. And then, of course, there are the penicetums. There's a lot yeah. of penicetums. But one, one of, of my favorites is the Hamel, and it's, it's dwarf one. But it, this time of year, in the, in the late summer and the fall, got those little foxtail looking mm -hmm. seed heads out on it, cool. yeah. look really nice. Yeah. Another one that I like really well, which is a very large one, it's called Heavy Metal. And, oh. and it will get, it, it yeah, will. I can see her, I can see I, her having it in her yard. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> Heavy Metal. It, because it's a, yeah. it's a blue green grass that gets six to eight feet tall. Oh, and wow, this time of year, tall. it's got these beautiful fuzzy Inflorescence it's on the navy. top of them, navy too. and oh, navy. I just, yeah. I just love it. And they say, I keep hearing that there's supposed to be a dwarf form of it. It's only going to get <laughs> three to four feet tall, but I've I never seen, seen it. Yeah, I, I've not seen it mm -hmm. anywhere in the trade. So maybe it's just a rumor. Who knows? Like heavy metal. But heavy metal, <laughs> yes, nice yeah. grass. And of course, we planted in the chorus here an ogon, the sweet flag yeah, out saw. front. Uh -huh. So right, we've right. got a, uh, we've got that nice yellow mm -hmm. going like out there, yeah. and of course at the University of Memphis, we've planted adagio, morning light, and muley grass uh, oh, muley all grass. along the railroad yeah. track, and of course we have the new bridge that goes across the railroad track. I saw that. So I saw that. softens. It softens the. 
It softens the railroad yeah, the track railroad and the track. fence yeah. and all that long, long line of, of uh, grass there. So, yeah. Come by and wow, see that's that. Good. That directive yeah. landscape knows what she's doing yeah. over there, huh? Sounds wow. like it. It's yeah, pretty good. for sure. <laughs> pretty good. All right, so how do we care for these ornamental grasses, though? That's what everybody wants yes, to know. Yes, everybody wants to know. Is there some know, care? Okay. Ornamental grasses are supposed to be easy to care for. Yeah. And I have Suppose. I have all different kinds around my house, and I don't I'm not real particular about watering, you know, all the okay. time and, and fertilizing all the time. I don't do that. They they should pretty much take care of themselves. Um, if they're not, then possibly that's not the right grass for that particular environment. Okay. Uh, I would do your research and make sure that your environment, even it's wet, dry, sunny, uh, shady, it doesn't matter. There's grasses that will fit all of that. So mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that the grass that you put in this environment is got want those conditions. And gotcha. if it doesn't, then switch to another grass because there's plenty of others to, to okay. choose from. Uh, that's what I would do first. And of course, they can be planted anytime the ground isn't frozen. Oh, they can be planted when they're here. dormant yeah. or in the growing season. It doesn't matter. Anytime they can be planted. Okay. Um, fertilizing, again, uh, if, you, if I even fertilize them, it would be in the spring okay. as they're coming out of dormancy and Anything getting into you the growing would use season. Particularly? I would just some, well, I would like to do a soil test and sure. make sure that I, you know, actually need all the nutrients in a complete fertilizer, but something like that mm -hmm. would be, would be my choice okay. if I put something, if I put anything down if, at all, right. because you really don't need to fertilize them every year. Maybe when they're first getting started and getting established, but after that, I have never fertilized any of I mine. Have not either. <laughs> Me either. I, 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 haven't I, I, haven't, I haven't done it. They don't. They really. That they're going to grow. Yeah. They, well, <laughs> they really don't need it. I mean, their their, their requirements <laughs> for fertilizer is yeah. not high. That's so. True. Yep. Um, of course, those that are dormant, now some of them are evergreen, which are great, and they can just, like our, our chorus up front. Okay. It, we don't have to, to prune that at all because it stays evergreen. Right. But those that go dormant, a good time to cut them would be in February. Good, I'm listening, okay. Because February, February right. is when they start, you know, they've been dried for a few months. Yeah. They've been blowing in the wind and you've enjoyed that sound. <laughs> but <laughs> then again, they start breaking up because they, they can't, hold that those dead leaves start breaking <coughs> apart okay. and you want to cut them before they start trashing the whole rest of the yard so it's going to get to rake them up from everywhere <laughs> so you want to get them cut them down in in the beginning of february yeah, so okay. that you don't have that leaf trash and all over the yard that? how do y'all uh, do it on see. the campus well it 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 various ways, you know. I mean, the depending big ones, on like how the big mess when you have big, big ones, yeah. some people will use a weed eater. Some people yeah. will use head shears. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. seen the head shears. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's about as far as I would yeah, go. I, I, I think shears. head shears would probably, if mm -hmm. you have a I've used large. Head shears. And yeah. what what I like to do is take a string and string them up and tie them and then cut them off no. and then you can just Ooh. move yeah. them Ooh. over yeah. and you don't have to have all that floppiness. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but tie them up first and then <laughs> cut them up. off and then you can just set the whole thing in a container and, and throw it out. So, wow. Um, well, we learned some good stuff on this show, yeah, are we? Yeah. How about that? That's pretty good. All right. And now they don't really have that. very many uh, pest problems. Good. So I, And if they do, it's probably a plant that's in the wrong place. Okay. So you yeah. want to try to move it to a either yeah. drier or wetter situation, sunnier or, dr or shadier. Uh, and of course, when they're they're clump, the majority of them. There are some that are runners, but the majority of them are clump grasses, and in, so they grow outward. But then they die in the center. Uh, and when they start yeah. getting big like mm -hmm. that, it's time to dig them up and rejuvenate them by taking a section of the the new the living part and putting it back in the center of where you have originally planted it. And then with the rest of it, you can either add on to your landscape or you can start trading them with neighbors and huh? everybody yep. can have ornamental grasses in their yard. Joanna, that was good stuff. We appreciate that. Yeah, uh, yeah the flowing and the sound. <laughs> yes, you can tell she's really oh, yeah. like yeah. yeah. So thank you for that. We appreciate that. <laughs> okay, as with most trees that I cut down over the years, I've always been interested in knowing the age of the trees that helps me identify what the area looked like many years ago. This is an ash tree, and an ash tree is a diffuse porous, meaning that sometimes it's hard to count the rings because the growth rings are 
mostly the same color. There's not a, it's hard to differentiate the early wood from the late wood. So we'll start from the outside and count in. And I've counted. This tree is a, is a approximately 21 years old, by judging by the rings. Let's see what's going on with the health of it. One, two, three. Something happened about three to four years ago that caused this tree to go in to decline. So before that, we got some really healthy growth rings. They're really wide. So that's telling me that this tree was, was a happy, healthy tree up until about four years ago. So that would incline me to go back and, and investigate and see what the type of weather we had that year. Was it a droughty year? Uh, it could have been a drought. Let's say, for example, it was. So this tree struggled after that drought and then had to use its stored energy to survive that one year. And then after that, I'm assuming that it just could not build up the energy to, to sustain its own self and eventually succumb to lack of energy. All right, Joel, and here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. These are great questions. Yes. Here's our first viewer email. What is the name of this tree? It came from the Arbor Day Foundation many years ago. It has beautiful yellow foliage in the fall. And this is Janice from Painesville, West Virginia. Oh, oh. yes. Well, it looks very familiar. Okay. It looks like an ash tree. Like an ash tree. Yes, and ash trees can have beautiful fall foliage colors. So. Wow. Yes, that's what that looks like. And that tree definitely had beautiful fall foliage, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah, so, Pretty. Yeah, thank you for that picture, Janice. Ash tree. Ash. Nice. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have a cluster of red river birch. The leaves are misshapen and there is a white dust everywhere. What is this infestation? Is there a cure? I am contemplating cutting them down. This is Nadine from Springfield, Florida. Yes. So let's see if we can help Miss Nadine out here, right? Yeah. Red river birch, right? So we have the river birch aphids. Which yes. sometimes goes by the name of witch hazel gall aphids. But it's host specific. Yeah. So it would be On the, the river, river birch, birch aphids, right? Yes. So their feeding, of course, is going to cause the misshaping of the leaves. That's going to make those I, leaves look yeah. contorted. You're going to have those bumpy ridges yes. on the surface of those leaves. But you know what I would do? Nothing. No, uh-uh. I wouldn't do anything. Because, you know, there's enough. It doesn't look like, it's not affecting the whole tree. It's just no. the new growth. Um, it'll be, the leaves are, are going to fall off here soon, yeah. and we can start over again. Um, I would just make sure that I would get all the leaves up, so you don't want the bugs to stay over winter. Right, right. So just you know, do some good sanitation and yeah. get the leaves up. Good sanitation would be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, let the predators, yes. you know, come and get them. Uh, and if the tree is healthy, it's going to be able to tolerate the damage. It so will. I wouldn't worry anything about that. Yes. All right. So there you have it, Miss Nadine. And thank you for the picture. Good, the nice picture. picture, yes. All right. And I should mention, too, that the, those uh, river birch aphids are covered in white wax. Yes. Because she mentioned that she saw white dust everywhere. So, yeah, it's... they're covered in white wax. Right. So if you disturb them, yeah, they kind of, you know, flock off. And, it, yeah, it's I can see what looks like white dust. And some people say it looks like snow, mm -hmm. you know, falling. So, again, thank you for that picture. All right, here's our next viewer email. I know you like this one, right? I would like to plant a service berry tree in my yard to attract the cedar waxwing birds. Recently, I learned that there are two types of service berry trees. Is one type of service berry tree better than the other in a residential setting? I'm in zone six. Thanks, and this is John. So how about that? Yeah, and thank you for letting us know what zone yes, you're in. Yes, that helps. Because that really does <laughs> that help. Helps. But you know what? He's picking a great tree that is very underused. Um, either one will do well. Okay. Uh, they are uh, both about 15 to 25 feet right. in cultivation, and in other words, in somebody's yard. Mm -hmm. One of them, Amelanchier arborea, the uh, downy service berry, that one has a lot of cultivars to choose from. So you can okay. get some really pretty foliage with that. And it's a four season tree. Mm -hmm. You've got flowers, yeah. Yeah. you've got beautiful foliage, you've got fall color. So it's, it's a, an all year mm -hmm. good tree. Um, the other kind, the Allegheny, is mm -hmm. actually native from Newfoundland down to Georgia and west to Michigan and oh. and Kansas. Easy as all six. So then. and yeah. but there's not as many cultivars of that. Okay. So I would say whichever one he can find, and if he has good research and, and can find a certain cultivar that he's more interested in, then I would get that one. But either one would be fine. Either one would be fine, Mr. John. Yeah, we appreciate that question. Yeah, good like question. you mentioned, good fall foliage. Beautiful. The ripe berries. 
right? right. So Very, it's a and good, they're edible. Edible, right? Mm -hmm. They're used with jams and jellies, I've, yes. I've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and wildlife. wildlife. The pollinators love it. Yes. Right. So there. Yeah. Good like that. Yeah. Good, good tree. Seems very be good. All right. Thank you, Mr. John. Here's our next viewer email. Here is a photo of a twig from one of my many oak trees. I pick up many of these twigs every day. The leaves don't look great either. Is my tree sick or are the squirrels chewing these twigs off my trees? If it is squirrels damaging my tree, I have a 20 gauge, but no 12 year old. <laughs> All right, an ode to Mr. D there. Yes. This is Phyllis from Rosemark, Tennessee. So <laughs> yeah, we thank you for the picture too. So what do you think about good. that? Yeah, it's a good picture. I, I think it's squirrels. Oh, squirrels. Because yeah, this is yeah. a time of year, they want to still have the leaves on the trees to be able to make their nests. Mm -hmm. And they're not always good at keeping a hold of them and a lot of them drop on the ground. Right. So yeah, it's it's the squirrels trying to make nests in the trees. It's, it's definitely squirrels. I actually know this, right? Because I recently was running down the green line and one of these uh, twigs happened to fall down right in front of me and there was a squirrel <laughs> right on top and I looked at it and it looked just like the picture. Uh, so it's definitely uh, definitely squirrels yes. you know, is doing that. Yeah, just trying to make a nest. They're, yeah. they're fine. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. It's good. Uh, so no need for a 20 gauge no. in a 12 year old. No. All right? No need for that, Miss Phyllis. Think so. <laughs> So there you have it. Thank you, Joel, and that was fun as always. It was. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. It's getting to be the end of the growing season. We hope your garden did well. If you have a problem this year and can't figure it out, ask us. It's simple. Go to familyplotgarden.com and click on the Ask Us Your Gardening Question banner. We'd be happy to answer them over the winter and get you ready for the next year. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.